Transform Kenya. Empower our nation. Welcome back. You're watching Transform Kenya Forum here on KTN News with me, Abi Agina, with a very rich panel set tonight. We shall be we actually discussing matters to do with the microeconomy and how the coronavirus has impacted on the economy and what are the options for Kenya. Before we went for the break, we were having some rejoinders from our panelists who are joining us from multiple locations. And our, of course, our, our area of focus then was what the CS for the National Treasury had said in terms of missing the revenue collection targets. Let me now open it up once more to our panelists tonight, throwing it, of course, to my good panelists there, that is Henry. <coughs> Thank you. Um, it, it is true what the CS has talked about, uh, the dwindling uh, national kick in, in terms of uh, the, the revenues available. But uh, I want to be on the positive side and see the opportunity that is coming with all this. And the opportunity is for closer integration within the financial services sector, within the government institutions that are also financing enterprise, so that then we can ensure that we are able to revive these businesses that are uh, seriously affected by the, the impact of the, of, the, of the coronavirus. And I think the greatest challenge will be how will the financial services sector unlock liquidity, both during this period and especially post-COVID, what will we do to increase the shillings available in terms of working capital? I'm not talking so much on the consumption side because uh, I know it can be a challenge right now, but we must create liquidity after. Yes. Good point. Habil, I can see you are itching to respond. How do we increase liquidity in a time and space where the revenue authority is struggling to hit the targets? Um, maybe just before I address the issue of liquidity, I think what the CS um, mentioned, um, you know, the immediate response that we saw was government directive to try to cushion um, the employees, um, uh, companies, and therefore things like, for example, uh, reducing the VAT rate, yes. reducing the pay-as-you-earn um, uh, tax rate, reducing the corporation tax rate, um, a number of measures were actually put in turnover tax um, uh, that affects the SMEs. A number of measures were taken to cushion the various, um, you know, uh, members of the public who are affected in, in, in various ways. But all these measures actually boil down to the fact that the revenue sources for the government are significantly diminished. And then on the other hand, we are uh, more should or less they, Should requesting. the SMEs be worried, Habel? If Right now, many SMEs are struggling, and yet you're saying our resources are diminished. Should they be extremely worried? Well, they, they, sh they should be worried, partly be not, not worried necessarily, but the issue is that, for example, the movement on the turnover tax, which was moved down from 3% to 1%, was meant to cushion the SMEs, which is a positive thing. But on the other hand, we are diminishing the possible revenue sources for the government. And so at the end of the day, when we are expecting a stimulus package to come from the government, and the very same government, uh, their revenue sources have been diminished, I think it becomes extremely difficult. Okay. And to the point that Henry raised, which is the issue of where do we get liquidity from, I think expecting it from the revenue sources that uh, the National Treasury has, I think that would be fairly limited. So we have got to think very imaginatively on other sources of, 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 of liquidity. And what comes to mind, is now that the government um, sources are not as uh, likely to be forthcoming as uh, you would expect, I think we can fall back on, for example, the DFIs, the development financial institutions, um, the World Bank, the um, IMF, the Africa Development Bank, and, and the like, who at this point in time we actually can call on them and they are putting in place funding that is specifically targeting to cushion the countries against these, uh, the effects of the pandemic. All right. The other one is, of course, the donor community. The donor community, um, this is the time when we can get them to come in and um, uh, avail liquidity to support the struggling economies. Okay. Well, uh, we are now joined by one of our... Uh, actually, we shall be getting back to that... We, shall, we are actually looking forward to getting your questions as well tonight on our discussion where we have opened up our lines. You can join via Zoom 
And remember, you can also send your questions via slido.com. Well, in still staying with this conversation, uh, let me now bring in uh, Madam Jacqueline. Of course, uh, you've talked about the measures that the various companies have taken, including um, pay cuts, matters to do with uh, people taking unpaid leave. How is this likely to impact on small businesses who are already cash starved and they are struggling to make ends meet? People who are running businesses in the Juakali sector or someone running a shop down there in uh, Kamukunji. I think that is one of the biggest challenges and um, the biggest questions that is facing us today as a nation. When we realize the extent of this crisis, I think the immediate uh, realization was that the small business and the informal economy would be the hardest hit. And yet the irony is that most of our jobs are in those sectors. The, the federation which I had has 40% of its membership in that sector and in that segment of the economy. So we pushed very hard for cushioning to be given to the SMEs and uh, we are happy that the turnover tax was reduced from 3 to 1%. But the reality is that they will be hard hit. And uh, we need to, as a country, look at how to, to support them and how to give them some skills in terms of business continuity planning now. And that would then see them tied over the, the crisis and recover post-COVID. Post but that's a real challenge. And I wanted to say, as a person who pays tax and probably is not a financial guru, uh -huh. <laughs> that once business pays tax, then we look to government to stretch that money to run the economy. But uh, the size of the formal economy that pays taxes, again, is very small in our country. So we need to look at how to formalize the informal economy, the Juakali, which is where business is where the real uh, indigenous people are to be able to, to stir it up. But in terms of support to them and what we've done is really having conversations with unions where they exist and with our employees to see how to manage the downtime when no work is happening so that we are able to share the burden. And uh, a lot of unions and employees are actually willing to take uh, pay cuts or to go on unpaid leave because by the end of this month, most employees will have exhausted their leave. So we have to resort to unusual measures, which is what we are calling it for now, because it cannot be a burden that is borne by business alone. These are conversations that will continue, and they are happening at the Ministry of Labor level. Even as the CS says that the, uh, the government doesn't have money, we are still looking to, to the same government perhaps to reorganize its expenditure the, the fact is that not much is happening. We are focusing primarily on the crisis and money should be spent on health matters and also on sustaining enterprises and helping keep people in jobs. And uh, Charles, you run a Pan-African bank and what would be your reactions to this? A lot of points that have been highlighted. I, th I think they are First and foremost, the issue of about realigning the government budget, I think it's an important one. Um, we may have to cut off a lot of capital expenditure um, so that we can redirect it to dealing with this issue. The issue of raising uh, external funding is important. I mean, if you just look at what has happened in the last, uh, since uh, COVID started, $83 billion has left the emerging markets uh, um, kind of as, as a part of flight to quality. So we've seen this kind of migration of money out of emerging markets. And I think it's important that we also look at international organizations, whether they are DFIs or they are donor agencies, to see how they can support uh, some of these challenges. The, to cushion the SMEs, I think that has been highlighted quite a lot. And a couple of things that come into play is, of course, um, banks rescheduling the loans, which we've, what we've done, um, and we keep doing, I mean, a stand big. I mean, we've to date almost reached to 16.5 billion shillings uh, worth of loans for SMEs. Uh, and we keep working on how we can improve uh, to support them as we go forward. 
but we're also looking beyond just rescheduling loans. We're also giving opportunities. I mean, for example, we're trying to open lines for them for China. Um, at, at the moment, anyone who is importing medical supplies, we can offer them 5% discount on, their, on the orders that they're doing. So we're trying to create opportunities for them to be able to see that. And we're also trying to give them um, training opportunities as well um, so that they can be able to get some level of training um, because they have to understand the new legal framework, they have to understand the new tax laws. So it's part of the work that we're all doing to offer opportunities for, for small businesses to be able to thrive and to survive while creating markets for them and see new opportunities. We're also giving support for those who want to divert into new industries that are coming up because we know there will be new businesses that are coming up and they have to redo their businesses. So how do we support them to redo these businesses? That's some of the issues that we are working on as part of the cushioning that we need to, to look at into the, into the future. Okay. But there's also a piece which as corporates we have to deal with as well, which is how do we support the corporate activities or the community activities? And I know as part of our Kenya Bankers Association, we have been working to help raise money to support and fight COVID. All right, Charles, very interesting uh, points there and of course some very timely interventions. We want to now take some questions also from our viewers joining us from home and uh, different platforms. Well, uh, we have some questions now on our Slido platform. And um, let me now quickly just quick uh, read through a few of the comments. Well, uh, our first question is from Ogwell. He's saying that uh, it is no doubt that the heaviest burden to the Kenyan worker is rent, especially those living and working in urban centers. Apart from the government's moral uh, suasion to landlords to be considerate, what practical incentives and subsidies can the government in place take to cushion tenants and landlords? Another question here from Carol Wamboi. She's asking uh, to the CEO of Stanbeck, how are you supporting individuals with SMEs and personal loans to help them keep afloat in this critical time? And uh, let's take a uh, last question so that we can also get your responses uh, from uh, Duke Oeba. He's asking, I have noted with concern that uh, most of the COVID-19 care packages are given to poor city dwellers. What is the government doing to support poor citizens living in villages and semi-arid areas? What are the measures taken to cushion and support the small-scale fruit and vegetable farmers? And remember, Duke is watching us from South Africa in Johannesburg, who has also sent in his question. Let me quickly direct uh, the first question to Charles in terms of how are you supporting SMEs with personal loans, and uh, do you fear that what will happen if they default? We have taken a decision that will give them payment holiday, which we announced much earlier on. I think we're the first bank to announce that. And as I've indicated to date, we have uh, rescheduled or reorganized loans for 2,565 uh, SMEs and individuals. Uh, worth about 16.5 billion shillings. So, so we've given three months uh, repayment holiday, which we'll review at the end of that period to see how that is. And it also gives you time to reorganize your own business and to see what you need to do so that we can be able to give you time to reorganize that. What we're also offering is that we've also, through our foundation, started to offer training for SMEs as they start to retool and reorganize themselves the things that we are talking about right now around how do you work from home, how do you organize yourself, what new technologies do you need to have, how do you put them together. That's something that we've worked on. Um, we also found a lot of them have been asking us questions around legal and tax issues, and we are also giving support to understand those issues. Okay. Um, the third thing that I've highlighted is that for those who would like to import from China, we are offering particularly medical supplies We've got a China-Africa desk that have opened and we've got an agent in China that's helping them import medical supplies and you're getting 5% discount on those imports that you do. So we're seeing ourselves playing a pivotal role in supporting you and we'll be there for you. So if for any reason you want to talk to us, 
please feel free to get in touch with us. We'll be able to support you directly and to research your loans and give you the support that you require. Well answered there, Charles. I want to hear what Habil has to say. How practical is it for almost the over 40 uh, uh, licensed banks in Kenya to go the same route? How practical is it? Um, and I, I think that is the challenge that we have partly because of the fact that the, there's an expectation from the market that banks will be there to support um, uh, you know, in the event of, um, of such challenges arising. And so we have got to rise to the occasion and be able to really provide the support. And in order to be able to do this, a number of uh, measures have been taken um, at, the, at the industry level. And uh, some of them you must have seen announcements coming from the central bank. And some of them have got the ability to support the members to be able to rise to the occasion, as I mentioned. For instance, Central Bank, during the Monetary Policy Committee meeting, they made the decision to reduce the uh, central bank rate from 8.25 to 7.25. The effect of that is to bring the cost of funding to the banks down and therefore enable the banks to be able to own land to the customers at a, at a, at a cheaper rate, therefore making it affordable. To the, to the customer. All right. The other one was uh, a reduction in the um, what you call the cash reserve ratio. Cash reserve ratio from 5.25 to 4.25. That then brings the amount of liquidity that is held at central bank lower and therefore releasing that liquidity to the banks to be able to own lend to their customers. And a number of other measures have been taken up by central bank, for example, flexibility in terms of liquidity, um, the classification and uh, uh, provisioning of, of accounts arising out of these uh, uh, COVID challenges. There's a bit of flexibility there. And that then enables banks to be able to respond to the demands from the, from the customers. Thank you. And uh, to Jacqueline and uh, Henry, there's that question of rent. How do we get to ensure that we also give uh, rent reliefs to the SMEs and to, of course, uh, the general population of workers in the country, Jacqueline? I think that's a tough one because um, most of the premises that are being rented by the SMEs who need their relief don't belong to government, so the government can't um, control uh, the agreement that they have. But I think there's been an appeal from the head of state himself to landlords to have consideration and if they can't give some relief or renegotiate the terms or give um, tenants who are un unable to meet the terms of, of the lease some time to be able to pay. Of the latest one, of course, was the bill that is currently being discussed that was moved by Senate that seeks to cushion those who cannot pay their rent during the COVID-19 um, crisis. That raises some challenges because if you're a landlord and you're relying on that income for, for your upkeep, you may very well be having employees whose uh, salaries you pay and a moratorium is put on you claiming rent and that poses challenges. But I think in the spirit of um, togetherness as Kenyans, if a landlord is able to renegotiate and give a reprieve or a longer period for the tenant to pay, that is where the answer lies so that people are not kicked out. I think it would be very unfortunate for anyone to kick out their um, tenant at this particular time. But it's really a willing seller, willing buyer arrangement and appealing to the spirit of nationhood on the part of Kenyans to be able to bear with one another until um, uh, this season and this challenge is over. Of course, for those who are in earnings, it's, it's possible to plan around the income you're having, even if it's reduced. But the challenge is that most Kenyans live from hand to mouth, work on a daily basis to raise their money, to pay rent in the informal settlements. And that's a major challenge that uh, needs to be addressed. Um, and I, there are no easy answers, but I think it's just a question of the landlord and the person occupying their premises to be able to agree on maybe stretching out pretty much in similar fashion to what the banks have done, stretching out the period of repayment and agreeing on when, if there's default, when that can be paid uh, as soon as the tenant is able to do that. Henry, I'd like to hear your thoughts. You deal a lot with SMEs and someone sitting in Gikomba right now 
who is hoping to get rental income from the people that are in his premise and yet we are asking people to consider stretching uh, the payment or even forfeiting. How will this impact SMEs? Thank you. Like Jack is saying, that's an interesting one. But uh, just before then, there's a point I didn't want us to lose. And I think you just allow me to revisit this subject on, on financing, please. Yes. Um, uh, because the reality is that we must substitute imports especially if we are to revive our SMEs after, after this period. And this calls for an integrated approach from the financial services sector, both in government and the, and, and the private sector, so that we can be able, for example, to look at practical solutions and look at the reality differently. That, like Jacqueline said, the average micro and small entrepreneur is informal, so may not fit within the, the, the trade financing product that we might be talking about and the like. What we need to do then is to integrate our approach to it and come up with products that would really fit within the dynamics that we have seen. You've put it correctly. These are the people who are most affected. They represent over 80%. It means right now, Kenya is running on the 20% or less of, of the entrepreneurs. Now, uh, so that calls for serious rethinking about the how to support them through credit guarantee schemes that will then make it easier for the private financial institutions, especially to invest in this, and that is on the government side, and that will be very important. Now, coming back to the Gikomba question, uh -huh. the, the challenge is that even the landlord in Gikomba is, is our customer, is a micro and small entrepreneur. So it becomes difficult, but I think the government also on our side will look at things like a rates waiver from the county government side and other tax incentives that would also make it easy for the, for the SMEs to be supported uh, by the landlords in this case. Thank you. And uh, your point brings us to our next uh, area of discussion where the president and of course the minister in charge of the National Treasury did appeal to employers to be considerate. Let's listen in on that clip first. Call for a lot of understanding, particularly from the business community, to consider this as an act that now requires extraordinary understanding. Because if you only look at only the, the profit side of it and lay off people, then we are going to have a serious situation in the economy. That's going to be a problem for all of us. So we do hope that, yes, you will take a hit, we will take a hit, but together, we must protect the social fabric of our society, which is keeping our people gainfully employed and engaged. With well, President Kenyatta there indicating that uh, both private sector, government will take a hit. And Charles, uh, moving forward, uh, right now we are at a critical stage where businesses are struggling to survive. And uh, interest rates are still at about 13.5%, and we are hoping to see uh, further reductions in interest rates so that SMEs can borrow. Perhaps what would be your immediate reaction in terms of uh, having cheaper credit to boost liquidity in these times of uncertainty in the economy? Yeah, I mean, that's a fundamental point. And um, I, if you remember when the interest rate cap was reduced, um, we're all looking at, we all committed to, as an industry, that we will not be seeing any further increases in interest rates, and we held those loans that have been borrowed at the CBR rate. Um, going forward, clearly, the circumstances that we are in now, a number of steps have been taken, particularly by the central bank. Um, the first one, as you know, was to reduce the, to avail liquidity into the banking sector, to allow banks to be able to, to lend by reducing the um, the, the liquid ratio for the banks from 5.25 to 4.25. And do our whole essence is for us to rechannel that money back to reschedule some of the loans for our clients. Um, as we have seen, between September and to date, the central bank has reduced the interest rates by 1.75 uh, basis uh, per percent. So that's also part of the push to reduce the cost of funding and, and credit to our, to our customers. Um, the third leg is we are all looking at what are the opportunities that we have to get uh, credit support. And, and largely what we are trying to do here is to get uh, what we call risk sharing models where we work with um, NGOs and DFIs uh, to be able to, 
to get money that can allow us to lend at a cheaper rate than what we have been doing so far. And uh, speaking for Stanbig, we certainly have made some progress around that, uh, targeting specific sectors like horticulture that have been heavily hit, and we are looking at this near future to be announcing some steps around how we can be able to support those sectors and be able to get them cheaper funding. That's actually what we are all working on. The reduction in uh, VAT, of course, reduces costs as well, which helps uh, the SMEs to be able to afford and uh, to be able to support themselves. Uh, the China thing that I spoke about earlier on also helps reduce the cost for the businesses as well. So it's looking at the rest, cost of borrowing, but also cost of doing business in general, and how can we make it more affordable for our customers and be able to support them in these businesses that they can be able to ride through this uh, difficult wave that we have. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. So we want to take a few questions now from our online platform, that is slido.com, where we are having quite an engaging uh, discussion coming in on our platforms, uh, very interesting questions. Allow me to now quickly just uh, look at some of your questions uh, back home. Well, uh, there's a question here from uh, Dr. Josiah Nyangwachi. His question is, can the Federation of Kenya Employers facilitate a forum for various stakeholders to discuss the paradigm shift to virtual working and learning platforms in Kenya? Indeed, a question there for uh, Madam uh, Jacqueline Mugo. Um, still the same, Josiah has another question. Perhaps we could skip that and get, get someone else to also ask a question. We have a question here from uh, Carol uh, Wambui. Oh, sorry, let me take uh, a question from uh, Koros Bernard from Kericho, who is asking, should it take us the whole of this year to tackle the COVID-19? Does the government have any plan on how to keep our economy afloat? That's a very interesting question. And uh, do we take some more? Well, we'll be taking uh, more of your questions shortly, but uh, those are some of the questions that are coming in. Uh, Jackie, would you have a quick reaction to that particular question being raised on FKE. Yes, definitely. That's um, a very good question and uh, something I can certainly confirm we can do. We have actually been carrying out webinars for members since this uh, crisis hit us. So far we've done four. That is one of the topics that we had thought we would do and with this question will certainly expedite the inclusion of that as a topic. How can employers facilitate uh, virtual work for employees at this time? So we'll take up the challenge and I can promise that we will do that. Thank you. Habil, what's your reaction to that question from uh, a gentleman from Kericho on uh, asking about uh, can the government uh, have measures to keep us afloat till end of the year? Um, well, the... Um and unfortunately, the representative from the government did not, uh, was not able to make it. But uh, I think there are, there are many ways in which we can look at this. And I look at it from where I see it from the banking sector. A customer who comes to you, I think there are bound to be three, four categories of customers. There is that customer who has identified an opportunity and can be able to jump in with this challenge and be able to um, um, produce something. And you have seen quite a number of them. For instance, the ones who are now manufacturing for the, PP, the PPEs that are, um, that, that are required, um, customers who have identified opportunities, various opportunities that have arisen out of this. Those are now the sort of like the growth sector. Then there are those customers who might be having some immediate challenges, fairly short term, we, who require short-term support maybe over the next two, three months or maximum four, five months to be able to get back onto their feet. And then there are those customers who right now have got challenges, but the kind of support that they will require will be a little bit long-term, where you need to be fairly patient and take a long-term view on those particular customers. And um, you know, there, there are several you know, um, types that you can think about. For example, the hotels and uh, involved, those involved in the tourism and hospitality segment. Yes. And then finally, there are those who obviously will be casualties, which means that those industries will die, those businesses will die. And you know, we, we have to accept that that's a reality. And so um, that kind of a customer, I think it would be inappropriate for, for example, the bank to be pushing to support 
when clearly is a dying um, kind of um, uh, possibility. Right. And therefore, I think from the banking sector, you need to look at it from that perspective and know where you can support because there is a probability that the, there's a, a viable proposition from the customer. And then there are those who eventually will either have to reorientate themselves, move into other segments, or, re or reorganize themselves in one way or another. Thank you, Habil. Well, and uh, with that uh, comment from Habil, we want to go on a quick commercial break. Remember, you can join our discussion via slido.com and our event code is Transform Kenya. And remember, share your questions on our platforms at KT News KE, and our hashtag is, of course, Transform Kenya SG. And uh, this particular debate has been sponsored by Stanbic Bank Kenya. For now, we go on a quick commercial break. We still have much more coming up. Transform Kenya. Empower our nation. This is KTN News.